Welcome once again. Right now we're at Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 16 all the way through to verse 39 more than conquerors. And I know we read verses 16 and 17 in the previous portion, but we need to read this once again because this gives us a context that leads us right in to verse 18. The Spirit Himself, speaking about the Spirit of God, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That is, of course, if we are truly, truly born of God, you have to be born again. And those who are truly born of God, truly born again, born of the Spirit of God, are very few and far between. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, if, there's a big if there, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. So what does it mean to suffer with him? To suffer with Jesus. How did Jesus suffer? Well, he denied himself. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And you know, a lot of people don't realize how horrific the death of the cross really was. He was torn apart. In the scriptures, it says his back became like a field that the farmers plowed. It says they ripped out his beard. It says that they beat him and they massacred him so much that they couldn't even recognize him. And he hung on the cross, not with a little napkin around his waist. He was completely naked. That was part of the great humiliation of Christ. That was the ultimate, ultimate suffering of Christ. But he suffered throughout all his life. As we read not too long ago that Jesus came as a full human being. He had a human body, just like everybody else has a human body. But he did not sin. And because of that, he suffered. You know, naturally, a human is naturally inclined to sin. A human is naturally inclined to destruction. You know, I remember as a young boy, one time I sat out on the back of my grandmother's step. You know, it was an old wooden step and there was like a, a concrete sidewalk, you know, in front of the step. And I was just sitting there relaxing and I noticed some flies that came and landed on the concrete walkway just in front of me. So I went and I got a fly swatter and I hit one fly and I killed one fly and another fly came and I killed another fly. And you know, before you know it, it had like three, four, five flies there. It was all in one spot. And then more and more and more flies started coming. And after I killed dozens of flies, then I was able to start smelling. There's this smell from all these dead flies. And you know, that smell attracted more flies. The flies were attracted to their own death. And that is the way a lot of people are. They are attracted to their own death. Jesus now, he humbled himself. I mentioned about the cross and how that was great suffering for Jesus. But even just fasting, you know, he had that 40 day fast and he was tempted. He was tempted in all ways, but yet he did not give in to sin. That is not very easy, okay? That is suffering. To have a very, very strong temptation to sin. Now, the devil himself tempted Jesus, okay? It wasn't just anybody. It wasn't just any spirit. It was the devil himself that tempted Jesus. So it was a very, very strong temptation. But Jesus resisted that. And that, again, was a part of the suffering. Then later on, when Jesus was ministering and preaching, you know, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, and he suffered because of the flack that he gained from that too. Healing the sick, raising the dead. So he was falsely accused many times. And that was more suffering. And on top of that, he was constantly rebuking the sinners, calling them hypocrites, and calling them whitewashed tombs, brood of vipers, family of snakes, sons of Satan, sons of hell, and on and on it goes. And these people were very, very angry with him and they wanted to kill him time and time again. That again was suffering on Jesus' part. He preached the truth and he suffered for it. Now, it says we are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with him. We suffer with him in resisting temptation. We suffer with him in resisting false accusations. And we suffer with him because we preach the truth. We preach righteousness. We preach against sin. We preach holiness and repentance as Jesus did. 
and we suffer with him because we get the same flack that Jesus got. We get the sinners hating us for calling out their sin. We get the religious people hating us because of their misinterpretation of the scriptures and their false accusations and their hypocrisy. And then, as Jesus said, we have to take up the cross and follow him. We must deny ourselves. That is suffering with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, all those sufferings we just talked about, are not worthy to be even compared with the glory which will be revealed toward us. For the creation waits the eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of decay into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Not only so, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for that which he sees? But if we hope for that which we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself, the Spirit, not us, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, a lot of people who believe in speaking in tongues, they use this verse as one of the verses that they use to support that doctrine. So they say that the Spirit of God prays through us, you know, through tongues because we don't know how to pray. So the Spirit makes intercession through us. But you know, that is not really what Paul said here. Paul said the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. You cannot put it into words. That means tongues. That means languages. No matter what language you speak in, it cannot be uttered. He who searches the hearts knows what is on the Spirit's mind because he makes intercession for the saints according to God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. There's a condition there. For those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that God works all things together for good for everybody. For those who truly love God. And loving God means loving God more than yourself, more than your lusts, more than your desires, more than your plans, more than anything that you have or own. Loving God means denying yourself and loving him with all your heart. Not half your heart, not 90% and 10% is selfish. No, it is all. You love God with all your heart. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. To be conformed to the image of his Son. What is the image of his Son? The image of Jesus. The image of Jesus can be found in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament. How can I say this? Because Jesus himself said this. When he was talking to the religious people in his day, he said, you search the scriptures. Of course, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures. You search the scriptures, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketavim, the Tanakh. Because in them alone, in the black and white words, the ink on paper, you think that in them alone you have life. But they all speak of me. I am the living, breathing Tanakh. I am the living, breathing Torah. I am the personification of everything you read. So what is the image of his son? Read the Tanakh, the Torah number one, Nevi'im number two, and the Ketavim number three. That is the image of his son. That is the written form of Jesus. Jesus is the human form of the word of God. And what we have in writing in our scriptures today is the written form of the word of God. And they do not clash, okay? They are one. So he predestined us to be conformed in the image of his son in all of his Torah obedience, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, whom he predestined, those he also called, whom he called, those he also justified, whom he justified, those he also 
glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how would he not also with him freely give us all things? Who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. You see, Paul says a lot about God's chosen ones here. Talks about the predestined ones. This is the teaching that dates all the way back to the book of Enoch. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Even as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. So Paul quotes from the Old Testament here, Psalm 44, 22, to support his doctrine. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. What does that mean? You think about it. In history, there were a lot of conquerors. Conquerors who conquered cities and conquered countries. But you know, those people, even though they conquered countries, perhaps they had a lot of things that they could not conquer, i.e. self, i.e. pride, lust, and sin. But we are more than conquerors if we can truly say what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. We are dead to sin. By faith, we have overcome. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very, very key phrase here. In Christ Jesus our Lord. That means a lot. Being in Christ means a lot doesn't just mean to have a mental ascension, uh, you know, some kind of uh, data in your mind. Yes, I know Jesus was born and he lived and he died. And it's not just talking about just knowing data, information. Being in Christ means that you are born again. You are risen with him. That the old sinful self is completely gone and all things have become new. You are out of of the old life. You are out of the old man and now you are in the most holy person in the universe. You are in Jesus. You know, a lot of people talk about Jesus being in their hearts. Let's talk about what it means to really be in Jesus, to really live a life that's in Christ, to live a life that's in Messiah, to think thoughts that are in Messiah, to walk the walk of holiness in Messiah. In the next chapter, Paul talks a lot about predestination, which is going to be awesome. We're going to talk about free will and predestination. A lot of arguments, a lot of questions boils down to the issue of free will versus predestination. It is very important, and I'm telling you, I am very excited about it. So don't miss it. Until next time, seek God with all your heart, and if you do, you will find him. Call upon him, and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.